Director of Campus Security here at UATLO. I've been here for approximately a year and a half. I was seven years on Oahu at uh, Wimbledon Community College and Honolulu Community College, and with the 10 years before that, I was at Hawaii Pacific University. And the purpose of my being here today is to uh, speak with you guys about emergency response in general, specifically a campus lockdown exercise that we're going to have at the end of this month, and then to get in, into some more specifics about what exactly a lockdown entails and how that might be comparable and or different from the active threat or active shooter type of responses. I really want to try to make this uh, uh, very simplified. So my hope is that at the end of this presentation that most of us will walk out of here with a much better understanding of, of UH Hilo's emergency uh, response. There's a uh, sign-up sheet going around, so please continue to uh, pass it around and sign in. And if if the sheet is full, just somebody let me know, and I'll and I will uh, replace it. But I think that we shouldn't fill it up. Okay. I don't know if I can stand here the whole time. <laughs> okay, I'll try to talk louder. Okay, so um, the um, agenda for this presentation, which I think I pretty much laid out already, is that um, we're going to talk about <coughs> emergency notification, emergency response to threats in general. Uh, campus lockdown, some of the issues that might come up in a campus lockdown. Uh, we'll touch a little bit on our emergency management plan and, of course, have some focus on the emergency exercise that is planned for the end of this month. Our objectives is to, basically my objective, like I said, is to really simplify things so that uh, we all have a really good basic understanding of what type of response uh, we're looking for for general situations. So, emergency notification. Uh, emergency notification uh, here at uh, UH Hilo is not like emergency notification in a uh, grade school, right? They have a central office and they can push a button and they can say something to all of the students in all of the classes uh, in, you know, in five seconds and get that kind of message out. Um, for us, it's kind of different. We don't have, we don't have the, uh, the central system. We um, don't have a central check-in and check-out place. People can come to the campus from various uh, in various methods, so we don't know exactly who's here or where to make announcements to. And uh, what we do have in our emergency notification, or try to have, is redundancy, right? So when we uh, think about emergency notification, first thing we think of is the UH alert. We have the UH alert. Uh, that's a sample of it in the upper uh, left corner there. We have the emergency notification units. We have uh, external speakers. I don't know if you guys are walking around the campus and you see some building, you see this big speaker looking like it's from the 1970s and whatever, <laughs> it's sitting on the side of the building. That's one of our uh, external emergency alert speakers. We have the UH Hilo website, which uh, we can post emergency messages on, and social media. Now, I do want to 
say that the UH Alert has recently been upgraded. So now when we do a UH Alert, that message can automatically go to the website and the social media, and for our social media is Facebook and Twitter. So uh, that is a significant upgrade for us as far as emergency notification is concerned. And uh, you know, the reason why we have the redundancy is because, of course, we know that there's not one method that's going to get to everybody. If I put something on Facebook, everybody's not going to see it. Put on the website, everybody's not going to see it. Ian News, UH Alert, everybody's not going to see it. But if we have six different methods of getting that message out, then we've uh, definitely increased the chance of that message being consumed. Um, I'll just touch on this briefly. This is the cycle of emergency management. What I generally, in my position, what I generally concentrate on is prevention, preparedness, and response. That's, that's more um, my area of involvement in that, in that wheel. But of course, you have to have mitigation, and whenever we have any kind of incident, of course, there has to be a uh, recovery. But speaking of prevention, preparedness, and response, uh, prevention is relatively simple. We, we have uh, a plan that we put into place, a well thought out plan. We call it the emergency management plan. And we try to uh, incorporate all of our procedures and policies for campus safety in that plan. Uh, you might be interested to know that the uh, administration is close to finalizing uh, its emergency management plan and within maybe a couple of months at least should be available to uh, the entire community. Okay? So part of prevention is what we do. We assess the grounds and facilities. That's why we have campus security. Uh, and that's why we have you. And, and you guys uh, let us know when you see anything that looks uh, suspicious or awry. And we should uh, be trying to address that. As far as preparedness is concerned, well, we have the, of course, we have to have design strategies, but the main way that we prepare is through training and exercises. So this, you guys can consider training. We call it a presentation, but it would go, it would go under the, the title of training. And the exercise at the end of the month, of course, uh, we'll be practicing what we have talked about here and what we've done in the past. It won't be the first time we've had this type of uh, exercise. And as far as uh, the response, and the response we want to do is we want to activate our plan. We want to do, take all of the steps that our emergency management plan says that we should do. We want to cover all of the bases. That's why we want to have this in a plan so that when something happens, we can go to the plan and say, okay, you know, these are the things we did, these are the things that we need to do. So that's the way um, we deal with that part of the wheel on the prevention, preparedness, and response side. A lot of you guys are familiar with the emergency response guidebook. It's been out for about a year now. And if you look at the emergency response guidebook, I took the time to actually list all of the different um, topics now, uh, when to report, crime in progress, uh, medical emergencies, earthquake, fire, hurricane, uh, tsunamis, utility outages, bomb threats, sexual assault, workplace violence, active shooters, lockdowns, civil disturbances and protests, and even up to a missile threat. Now, when you're talking about emergency response, that's where it can get kind of, you know, scary. Happen, how am I going to learn uh, how to respond to this one, how to respond to that? So to simplify it, there's only basically four things that we're going to ask you to do and only three things, only three ways we're going to ask you to act. The first thing is we're going to notify you and say just stand by, you know, for more 
of information or um, stand by your yes booth for more information. Or we're going to ask you to evacuate, lockdown, or shelter in place. If that list grew by five more items, our responses would still be the things, the ways we would ask you to act would be either to evacuate, lockdown, or shelter in place. So I think it might be simpler to think of emergency response and, and, and that eyesight of, of evacuate, lockdown, or shelter than of uh, all the myriad of things that could cause one of those things. Each one of those is on a, what would you would call a response continuum because bullying and climate issues, right? That's very unlikely to cause us to evacuate or love them or shelter in place. But the truth of the matter is it could. And as you look at each other example, it's more likely that it could cause one of those responses. So within the small things up to the, the natural disaster type things, storms, uh, man-made issues, bomb threats, shooters, each one of them has its own continuum, right? So what we have is an emergency management team and we have a campus crisis those two teams are responsible for kind of vetting the It's like Taylor Swift just <laughs> Those two teams are are responsible for vetting <laughs> This is the the uh, severity of the particular threat and knowing and determining when it would be prudent for us to take one of those actions, whether it be uh, lockdown, evacuate, shelter in place. So evacuation, just to simplify it, we're going to evacuate if we understand or we believe that it is safer outside of the facility than inside of the facility or outside of the building than inside of the building, right? That, that would, that, that's, that's a simple, you know, that's a simple litmus test. Is it safer outside? If it's safer outside, let's go. Shelter in place is a little bit more tricky, but it's you still would understand, you would believe that it is safer inside than it is outside, but we're not really expecting the threat that's outside to come inside. So all we have to do to be safe is to stay put, shelter in place. And then you have the lockdown where it is, whether it's safer inside or outside, because the threat could be in or out, what our response has to be is to lock ourselves down in a particular area that we're at to make sure to give ourselves the best uh, opportunity to remain safe. So, real simple, is it safer inside or outside? If it's safer, if it's safer outside, evacuate. If it's safer inside, um, uh, shelter in place. If um, it's safer inside, but we're expecting an external threat that maybe will come inside, then we need to lock down. Okay. So,
about the emergency management response team for campus security. The first thing you will hear is an announcement over the campus public address system. Attention, attention, attention. This is security. Lockdown, lockdown, lockdown. Commencing lockdown procedures now. Next, all the digital signage on campus will display a message indicating that campus is in lockdown. You'll also see this information displayed on the college's website and social media networks. As soon as you hear or see the lockdown message, you need to take immediate action. If you're in an open area, such as the library or cafeteria, leave the area immediately. If you're close to an exit, leave the building and run away from campus. If you aren't able to exit the building, go to a location where you feel safe. If this is a room, close and secure the doors by any means possible. Turn out the lights. If there are windows, cover them or try to hide where you won't be seen. Turn off or silence any mobile devices. If you must communicate, use text messages only. If you hear the fire alarm during the lockdown, remain where you are unless you see visible signs of smoke and fire, then evacuate the building. Stay alert, stay quiet, not leave until the all clear is given. During the lockdown, campus security will also activate an exterior audible alarm to notify individuals not yet entered the building on campus of the emergency. When you hear this exterior alarm, anyone in immediate danger should attempt to flee. For those in a safe location, please follow lockdown procedures and lock or attempt to barricade doors. Remember, management response team for campus security will attempt to activate as many methods of notification as possible to alert our community of lockdown. If you hear any one of the notifications, the PA system, an exterior audible alarm, or see digital signage or Facebook and Twitter notifications, please respond immediately and initiate emergency lockdown procedures. What is a safe place? A safe place is any room or space where there's a solid barrier between you and the threat. It could be an office, a classroom, or any location where you can hide behind a locked or barricaded door. What if you're in a classroom or space with glass windows and doors? In common areas of rooms with lots of windows and few places to hide, the best option may be to leave the area. If you do decide to leave, make sure you don't move towards the sound of any disturbance. Either find a safe location building and run from campus. Secure and hold is another emergency response option that, when communicated by campus security, requires faculty, students, staff, and others to stay indoors during an incident or emergency when hazards may exist in the immediate area. Faculty, students, staff, and others still have full access within the building, but are requested not to exit any building until advised it's safe to do so. Should you help others? As long as it's safe to do so, you may provide assistance to those who need it. First, ask them how you can help. Then, help them get to a place of safety or exit the building. For more information on what to do in the event of a lockdown or secure and hold, visit durhamcollege.ca slash services slash campus safety. Okay, so a couple of things. One, uh, we do not have at UH Hilo, we do not have the external audible alarm. So uh, that's not one of the methods of notification or communication that we can offer you guys. And the other thing to note is that what they're calling secure and hold is the same thing as I was calling shelter in place. It's just uh, semantics, right? Um, as far as the team that is responsible for initiating a lockdown, 
our team is the campus crisis management team and or campus security. And then uh, we also have another supplemental team, emergency management team. If you saw some of the ways that they were locking uh, the doors, you see if a door has a door closure, you can use an item. It doesn't have to be your belt. You guys can, we can go to our departments and we can cut lengths of rope. We can get, uh, uh, one of the things that works really well is the, the old time, just the old extension cord. So one of the focuses on this particular presentation is I really want to talk about how we kind of think outside of the box and try to develop our own internal safety procedures. And when I say internal safety procedures, I'm talking about for our office and our department. I'm not talking about for the university as a whole because we have developed or are developing a safety procedure but it's, it would be wrong thinking to believe that that could apply to every single nook and cranny. Now, in other words, no one really knows your area as well as you do, right? So, in lockdown, obviously we want to remain calm, we want to uh, follow whatever instructions we have. The instructions will be to lock the doors, turn out the lights, get away from windows. Uh, if your door does not lock, that doesn't mean that, oh my goodness, it's all over. Then what we're going to do is we're going to find ways to lock the door. Some of the things that I, that I talked about, uh, when you have a double doors like this. You see the handles are on the outside there, but often you'll come across double doors like that with the handles on the inside, right? And, and on the outside. When you have that, you know, a simple two by four of this length can keep that door from being open from the outside. And of course, you want to remember that if someone is running around trying to do folks harm, they're always looking for the path of least resistance. All we want them to do is to bypass our door, right? So if I've got it all tied up with extension cord, guy's not going to sit there for 20 minutes trying to get in that door. He's going to go to the next. He's going to go to the next spot, and uh, and that's what we're we're hoping for. Uh, so again, we lock down when the threat is when it's uh, safer inside than outside, but there is a significant chance that that threat could come inside. Things like gas leaks, uh, chemical spills, sometimes either weather situations would cause us to shelter in place. And shelter in place is basically a lockdown without having the responsibility or the need to actually lock and barricade internal doors. Okay, so I think there is a lot of confusion when we talk about lockdown and then we have like last semester when we were preparing for an active shooter drill, right? And so what I got from going around talking to folks is that uh, folks weren't quite sure, okay, well, you know, run, hide, fight, you know, uh, but you're saying this is the lockdown procedure, how does that work? Well, the hide and run, hide, fight is the lockdown portion. Uh, this is a, a five-minute video that I'll throw, and then we'll be done with the, the videos, and we'll continue this. Thank you.
others to be with you, but don't let them slow you down with indecision. Remember what's important, you, not your stuff. Leave your belongings behind. Try to find a way to get out safely. Trying to get yourself out of harm's way needs to be your number one priority. Once you're out of the line of fire, try to prevent others from walking into the danger zone and call 911. If you can't get out safely, you need to find a place. Okay, is anyone, is there anyone who hasn't signed a sign-in sheet? Thanks. Can you pass it to that guy when you're done? Okay, so the reason why I threw this in here is because I believe that it's almost impossible to think about a lockdown, a campus lockdown, without thinking about the major reason why there might be a campus lockdown. So we're having this drill at the end of the month, and it's a lockdown drill. It's not an active shooter drill. We're not, we're not talking about running, hiding, and fighting. We're talking about the hide aspect or the lockdown aspect of a violent situation. Doesn't have to be active shooter now. It's active threat, violent intruder. A person could have a machete, it could be a baseball bat, but if they're here and they're here to do harm to people and they're moving around campus, we want to be able to effectively lock down. Keeping in mind 
that it could always get to that point where we have to act further than just locking down. And that's the importance, that, that brings up the importance of being able to have creative ways to lock an area that uh, a door that doesn't generally have a lock. Now in our plan, of course, we're gonna say, hey, if this happens, we're gonna go to this room and we're gonna go there and we're gonna do that. What I want you guys to also consider is what if you're where you're at and you can't get to that place that you envisioned, right? So now there are some choices to make. How do I, how do I lock down where I don't want to be, right? There's probably some areas in your area, in your departments, that you'd say, okay, yeah, not here. But what if you're, what if you're there? Those are the places where we want to think about, okay, can we uh, just barricade this well enough? Do we have enough, enough items inside to really barricade this uh, sufficiently? Do we have a uh, rope or extension cord that we can, we can uh, secure this door that uh, it just won't open or it would take the person too long to get it open? And so the challenge is, is not just to go back and look at the place that you want to be when the lockdown occurs or when, let's say, that emergency situation arises. We want to also look at the places that we might find ourselves in our area. Okay? So... Uh, that's one of the things that I want to have a dialogue going back and forth with you guys um, about, you know, go, going forward. You know, like what are, the, um, what are the methods that we can use to help keep our area secure? And it really is going to be up to you guys individually and departmentally because everyone has to do what makes them comfortable. Right? I could have two folks and one person's going to tell me, hey, I'm going to climb under the desk and get like that, pull the chair up, and I'm going to stay there until help comes. Next person would never do that. Somebody else would say, oh, no, I couldn't do that. I'm not going to just sit there and wait. You've got to come up with the, the, uh, the steps that you're going to feel comfortable with individually and then departmentally. And we're going to have our campus security officers, as they're going around doing their patrols, you can, you know, tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, you know, this is what, you know, this is what I'm thinking. We're not going to, none of us are going to say, no, 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 absolutely don't do that. But it always is good to have some feedback and, and a dialogue with someone about uh, what your plan is. Maybe they'll say something that you hadn't considered. Or, you know, maybe you guys will say something that we hadn't considered, and then we can add that information to our arsenal of information. But um, I did want to throw that in there because the, uh, the lockdown drill in this day and age is pretty much synonymous with an active threat. Okay? So, do you guys have any questions about the drill itself or the difference between a lockdown and a shelter in place? I'm sure we all understand the difference between locking down and evacuating. Or... So we'll go forward. So, oh. Um, those are automatically what we will do uh, when we do our lockdown drill and when we in, uh, initiate our lockdown protocol, we will lock uh, as many doors as we have the, uh, the time and or ability to do. So, 
If your question is, do we have the capability of locking down doors automatically with SALTO, the answer is yes. If your question is, can we lock down all of the doors on campus with, with the SALTO locks, then the answer is no. If you wanted to have a more detailed conversation about that, then I would, you know, we could, we could do that later, but we could, we could talk about that for the next couple of hours. But yeah, we do have the capability, but not all of the, all of the doors. Any other questions? Yes. So on the data that's also drilled, when we hear and see the alarms, we shouldn't just go, oh, it's drilled. It's like the tsunami warning siren or the first one. We should actually pretend there's an active shooter, and we should actually shelter in place, turn off the lights, lock the doors. True? Absolutely. What, what we're going to, what we're going to drop from the run, hide, fight, is we're going to drop the run and we're going to drop the fight. But everything, everything that you see in a lock, so we will lock down with the thought that we're trying to keep an intruder out of our area. And I'm glad you asked that question because if we don't do that, if we just say, oh, just lock the door and sit down and wait the 10 minutes until they give the all clear. That's not practice. We haven't practiced anything. And what happens is six, seven months later, we find ourselves in a situation, and the only thing that we've practiced is, oh, uh, get up and, and lock the door. So if you practice and you take yourself through all of those motions, and then you realize, oh, yeah, we don't have this. Oh, but we can use this to do that. And, yeah, and start creating your personalized response. And yes, that's what we're looking for, and that's, that, that's, that's what we hope that we're going to get uh, during the drill. Any other questions? Yes? Well, for hiding, what should we expect? I mean, are we expecting to hear you guys or a bunch of people going through and checking libraries? I mean, I don't... Okay, so the short answer... The short answer, because it's a drill. So the short answer is that you would expect nothing but wait for the all clear. Because we're not taking you through a simulation. Now, say that we had that active shooter drill that we were planning last semester, then it would have been more to it and that would have just been that one aspect of it. But right now what we want to do is we want to concentrate on locking down because if we can do that really well, we have a really big leg up on anything else that's coming down the road. So just imagine if we did have a violent intruder and when it came to the lockdown part, we all just went, yeah, okay, yeah, it'll be, you know. That would end up being disastrous, right? We really got to get this right as far as the practice. Let me see. I, I had a, a six Ps. Uh, <laughs> So planning, preparedness, and practice prevent poor performance. You absolutely have to practice. So like I said last time, you cannot be proficient at anything that you don't practice. Nothing. So we have to, we have to practice so that if, and of course the chances are very slim, that that's going to happen. But if it did, we would have a thought out and an adequate response. Adequate response doesn't mean that no one gets hurt. Uh, that's just not, you know, uh, logical. But it does mean that we, that we can significantly minimize any kind of damage that we, uh, that we do take on. So then let me ask you guys a question. If we do a lockdown drill, not if we do, because we're going to do a lockdown drill on July 30th, two weeks from tomorrow, what's the major benefit that we're going to get from that? What do you think? What's the major benefit that we're going to get from doing that drill? Preparedness? Figure out what we don't know. Right. 
actually learning how to lock your area sufficiently to keep somebody out. Let's figure that out. I think that one of the biggest things that we get out of that is, OK, so if there was an active shooter or an active intruder uh, six, seven months uh, down the road and we had practice, yeah, we would minimize some damage. Yeah, they're, they're, and those are really, really positive things. But if all of us were more knowledgeable, more comfortable, more understanding about what we had to do or what we could do to keep ourselves safe, that affects us on a daily basis. The, the angst that we all come to, to, to work or school with on a daily basis, right? All of the things that we have going through our mind, that possibilities, what could happen, what might happen, not an emergency preparedness per se, and all of the aspects of our life and what we deal with. If we could just lower the angst in that area that much, and then every day, every day that we come to work, we're just that much less stressed about things in general. And I, I think that work that will work for, for all of us. So that's that's what I, I wanted to to put out that as, as much as we hope that we'll never, ever, ever have to use this what we learn and actually face it, there's still benefit even though it never happens. And the benefit is that is that we can go forward feeling a little bit more safe and a little bit more comfortable and a little more like we know what to do if an emergency arose. Okay, so uh, when we talk about uh, an active shooter, again, or active threat, again, let's take the gun out of his hand and put a baseball bat, a machete, whatever it is, if a person is running around uh, with the intent to do harm, generally, he's not going to stop until either uh, he's stopped by law enforcement or he's stopped by someone else. But what he will do is he will continue to move throughout until he finds what are relatively easy targets. So we've got all of these doors here, yeah, and some of them open in and some of them open out and some you can lock from the inside and not from the outside and some you have to run around and swipe this way and, and some you got the closures and this and that. But we can figure, we can figure a lot of that stuff out and we can make a plan in our small area where we expect to be most of the time that would have us more safe and feeling more comfortable on a daily basis. Okay, so uh, as far as the campus is concerned, what, we, what our responsibility is, is to give early warning as much as possible using our notification system. We have to have uh, training, which like I said, we can consider this training. Uh, we can uh, have established escape routes. And I believe that a lot of our buildings do. It's really simple here because, you know, we don't have really complex buildings. So it's, I don't think there's any building on this campus that someone's got to, like, figure out how to get out of. I don't know. And... Uh, Location and identification of safe rooms. Let me just harp on this for a quick minute because that's what we want to focus on. And then, like I said before, we want to focus on what's next. So the number one thing I want to look at is where, where's, what's my best case scenario? Where's my go-to spot? How can I secure it the best, right? And then, okay, but if I can't get there and I am in this place, you know, what can I do? Because I don't want to be in that situation and say, oh, I couldn't make it there, so 
it's all over. I, I, I've lost, you know. You got to have plan B. Okay. Um, let's talk about helping others. So, of course, we have like the uh, access or the disabilities. Uh, we have a disabilities uh, department. A lot of us are walking around with various stages of limitations that none of the rest of us know about, right? So, of course, when we have situations like this, and I'm not talking about a drill, I'm talking about if we have a real emergency situation. Of course, as human, folk, as human beings, we want to help each other, right? We want to help as the best we can. Of course, we, we, there's going to be some point where we uh, have to focus on our, our own safety. But I would ask you guys, and I, don't, I, don't, I know that we can't do this um, institutionally, but in your various departments and offices and buildings and floors, try to, you know, if you, if you feel comfortable talking to someone about some limitation that you might have if you had to evacuate immediately. Or someone said run. And that's the thing about run, hide, fight. You know, everybody can't run. So some folks are going to be at hide already. It would be good to know in, your, in our little communities who might need a little extra help. Not to pass it on to campus security or anyone else, just so that you guys can kind of have that information so that you can better assist each other if uh, something were to occur. Okay, so the uh, lockdown policy has basically changed over the last, I've been, I've been now in higher education for 18 years, 19 years, and the whole focus or the whole thought uh, has done a complete 180. When I did my first lockdown drill at Hawaii Pacific University, uh, faculty, staff, and students were, um, got consequences for not participating and not participating correctly. So like even if you were claustrophobic and you felt like, oh my goodness, I'm not staying in here, I got to get out, if you left, that was, you know, you got, you got in trouble. Now, of course, that was years ago. It's not like that anymore, and it, should, and, and it shouldn't be. Because, again, we're talking about an emergency response that is particular to yourself. So we have our emergency management plan. It's for the campus and the campus community. And then hopefully in your areas, you have your emergency action plan that is specific to your group of offices, your department. And then individually, you guys have your own understanding, or you should be thinking about like what I'm going to do, what I can do, what I can't do. So if you're in a position where Again, to use the run thing, if somebody said, yeah, okay, everybody run this way. If that's not an option for you, you probably, you know, it would be best for you to acknowledge that before you got out in the open trying to get to the next spot. Um, so anyway, lockdown, lockdown. Uh, procedure, lockdown, drill. Is there anything about the lockdown that you guys 
are, would not be clear on. So then let me ask some questions. Uh, what would you do, uh, what would you do if your phone started ringing? Or would it already be turned down? It's, it's, it's vibrating. If it's vibrating, make sure it's not on a hard surface, though. <laughs> right? um, so if you were, if you look out the window from your office, if you can look out the window from your office, and you see a guy walking down the, uh, walking down the, the, the walkway there, and it looks like he's got some kind of firearm and he's walking with purpose and he doesn't have a happy look on his face. What's, what's your response? Is that the first response? What's your first response? Okay, so this very important is the lockdown. So now we talked about, we talked about how the lockdown works with the campus crisis uh, management team and the, and the uh, instruction coming down and you get the UH alert and the emergency notification units go off, the external speaker starts uh, blaring lockdown, lockdown, lockdown. But the vice chancellor didn't see this guy walking down with the gun and the mean snarl on his face. So what do we do? We lock down. We lock down. So my point is, when we come across a dangerous situation or potentially dangerous situation, don't believe for one minute that you have to wait until you get a UH alert, the emergency notification unit goes off, campus security comes by, whatever. If you see something that you believe is dangerous and can, and, and can cause a near immediate harm to you and your fellows around you, okay. or should I say more clearly, go into your emergency response. Because if, um, if it's more comfortable, if it's more prudent for you to lock down, yes, that's what you would want to do. You would want to lock down. If you're down, if your area is athletics and you're down in, in, in that area and everybody down there is, you know, 25-year-old athlete, then, they're gonna, then they, they, their first option would probably all be to run, and that's good. They could do that. They could get out of, they could get out of Dodge. Um, it changes over the years. <laughs> Again, um, any, any more uh, questions about lockdown procedure and or the drill? And remember, I'm just talking about the lockdown. I, I, I threw that little tease in there of the whole sh uh, active threat thing because I don't think we can separate our brain from that anyway. But what we're going to try to do uh, in a couple of weeks is we're going to try to have a solid, a solid lockdown exercise with everybody participating, everybody really focused on what's the best way that we can get the, and we don't, and we don't get there by thinking about that on the 30th. We get there by thinking about that right now as we're walking out the door. Yes. Right. So that's a good question. Here's what, I, here's, here's what I would do personally, and I do this a lot in my job anyway. I would, I would tell them somewhat authoritatively that this is what's going on, this is what we're doing. If some of them were to choose to do something else, okay, they, that's, that's there. They too have the right to do uh, whatever 
they feel is going to keep them safe. But I wouldn't pose it to them like, well, you know, we're going to go here, and if you like, guys like to come. And just, uh, I wouldn't do it that way. I, I would say it with some authority, like, you know. And you can say it with more authority the more practiced you are. Because you'll know that this, that this is a very good, safe spot. You already know how you can lock it down. And that'll come through when you're, when you're talking to someone else. Yes. No, You're, uh, the, the latter. So your priority as a faculty, staff, and student is not to secure anything but the door that's between you and the, per and, and, and I don't mean the, the front door of the library. You want to go as internal as you can find and secure that door. That's where, that's where you're going to make your stand at. You don't want to try to make your stand at the front glass door where there's, yeah. And is, am I answering your question? Yeah, I think I'm just wondering, what about the community members that might have been in the It's a little bit more difficult sometime in a library, but I've done this with libraries in the past. And so the thought is, in that type of situation, you bring everyone with you that you can and who is willing to go. Now, maybe there were two rooms that you guys had planned on locking down in. And now, all of a sudden, you've got 17 students with you. So two more rooms have to, you know, you have to find other spaces. But it's still better to take them with you. I mean, we have a, I would say we have an obligation, we have an obligation to at least try to uh, bring everyone with us. Just like uh, we talked about the folks who have some form of uh, challenge, uh, physical challenge, sometimes uh, younger folks, maybe they have uh, an emotional challenge where they just don't understand the severity of this threat. And it's like, and, and it's our responsibility, I think, to make sure that, hey, you know, you guys, you know, come with us. You're not going to get everybody. Everyone is not going to come. So we cannot, we cannot spend our time really just focused on um, getting everyone to a safe place. So there's, you know, when, when you join the police force or if you're in the Army and the Marine Corps, those are the types of jobs that are for folks like that. We're really concerned about getting ourselves to a safe place and anybody that we can help without hindering our own chances of survival. Yes. Uh, this is just kind of a comment. I work in the K building. Yes. Okay, K building, when you shut the doors, the halls become flat. And all of the, all of the rooms which have windows emit light underneath the doors. Even when instructors are in there pretending that they're not there, <laughs> they're walking around, and I know from the shadows that are Right. If you look at that ahead of time, you might want to bring a towel and put it under your door if you if you can't sit still. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and as long as long as you don't stick it under the door, because that's gonna that's gonna be a towel also. But laying a towel across the front, uh, that could be helpful. You know, that that brings up a good point too. A lot of folks uh, you know, for some years, the going uh, trend was to, to have these uh, curtains for your windows, right? So we, br we bring down the shades and we say, okay, you know, lock down, turn off the lights, bring down the shades, uh, and this and that. 
But if I'm someone who's familiar with this campus, especially a particular area of the campus, and I know, as a matter of fact, it was the library that, that had big shades like this. They're, all, they're never down. So then when we had, we had the drill, they came up with the idea, OK, so now we're going to pull all of the shades down. But when you do that, you're basically telling folks <laughs> that you're in there. So in that case, is, and these are the things that you do have to think about. You know, is me covering this window, is it saying that I'm not here, or is it really tipping somebody off that I am inside, right? But those are all, all of the things that we have to decide as individuals, as small groups, and then as larger groups, right? Okay, let's, let's do this. Okay, so some of the things that we uh, do have to assist you guys as far as emergency response is. First is we have a really good campus security team. I'm sure you guys know all of these guys. And as they're, as they're going around doing their patrols, please feel free to tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, what do you think about this? We're looking, I'm, I, I'm fairly sure that if you, if you give them a stumper, they're gonna bring it to me. And then I'll go back to you and tell you that we're all stumped. But anyway, uh, uh, please, please do that. But you guys should know where our campus security office is, right here in, in 151. The phone numbers, emergency, non-emergency. Inner office phone, uh, 7911. Silent witness. If you guys see something and you don't feel comfortable about letting us know that it's you putting your name to that report, you can make a silent witness report, or you can also uh, call security anonymously as well. We talked about the emergency response guidebook. I got to tell you guys, that guidebook is just packed with good information. Now, we're just talking about one thing. We're talking about a lockdown drill and maybe if it, it, it uh, included an active shooter. But, you know, what about terroristic threats and bomb threats? And what about uh, building fires and medical emergencies? And when we come across a crime in progress, all of these things are listed. Now, it's not giving you detailed information, but just general simplified information of what are the best natural responses to these type of things? And of course, we have the Emergency Guide app, which is the guidebook in the app form. And hold your hand up if you have it on your phone. OK, OK, we're getting there. We're, we're getting there. So uh, this is the the URL to download it, but you know, in the, somewhere in the near future, the next email that I send out, or actually every email that we send out, I think has it anyway. So uh, check your emails when you get them from, from campus security, anything uh, regarding safety, and it should have that link to the emergency uh, response app. So I ask you guys if there are questions, concerns, feedback pertaining to, I'm not going to expand in the parking tickets or anything like that, <laughs> pertaining to campus, emergency response, and lockdown procedures and or the upcoming lockdown drill. Okay. Uh, Outside, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, so the hope is that, remember we talked about the redundancy and announcements, right? And, and emergency notification. The hope is that those folks would be uh, notified in one of those methods. Now, the easiest method, and I guess I should plug this, is to sign up for the UH alert. 
because it's almost, it's almost nonsensical to complain about not being notified or, or complain about being in a situation where you might not be notified if you've never signed up for the UH Alert. I would get, as, especially folks that are working out like that, because they are your, your folks, right? Yeah, I'd make sure that they're signed up for the UH Alert. And remember what I said, now, when we send a message through the UH Alert, it automatically goes to the website, which might not be helpful, but it also goes to uh, Twitter and Facebook, which for a lot of people would be more helpful. But the shortest answer, Lisa, is we just always, we just do the best we can do. Main thing is that you make sure that you go home safe that night. Your job is, is not to, you cannot, there's always going to be somebody to protect. When we do a lockdown, lockdown also means lock out. When, when, when it gets, when, when these buildings and these areas gets locked, get, get locked, there are going to be some people who are on the other side of that. And none of these plans would ever work if every time you saw somebody say, oh, yeah, open it up, that's Charlie. Open it up, that's, that, that's just not going to work. So lockdown does mean lockout, and that's another reason why we want to really get really practiced and proficient at how we're going to how we're going to do this. If you guys don't have any more questions, then I'll just say, oh, excuse me, sir. Um, I have a question I wanted to ask. What, um, so this is referring to um, the Alert Center, right? Yes. Um, what do you think? Thanks, and I know you know the answer to that question, but thank you. That's, that's real, and that's a miss on my part because I, I, that should have been part of the presentation. When, when Columbine happened, that was their original plan, was to, to pull the alarms and have everybody come out and get them all out in the open. So what the going advice is on that is unless you see evidence of a fire, you are to stay put. Because would a potential, would, would a, a shooting threat, would the shooter, the intruder, would they pull the alarm to get people to come out? You bet they would. So the guidance is, unless you have physical evidence, you see physical evidence, that there is a fire nearby that you would stay put. Okay. Yes. I will follow up with that question. Is it fair for the university community to expect a second alert that says disregard or ignore the fire and is disregarded so that that would then be reassuring that the first message they get is really the one to follow? Well, as far as the fire alarm is concerned, I, the way I would tie that in is to our UH alerts, right? because the, the campus uh, crisis management team, who might be the ones responsible for sending out the UH alert, if, uh, we're, we're also responsible for periodic updates, right? So if during that emergency, someone has pulled the fire alarm and we know that it was, you know, uh, an attempt to deceive folks, then that would, we would have the opportunity to address that in our next UH alert. So I would say, yeah, it would be incumbent upon us to, to get that straightened out if we could. Yes, Sonny? Do we really want to be lighting up everybody's phones with additional alerts that are false Well, that's, a, that's a, uh, a good question. But I'll tell you, that's what, for every, for every act of safety that there is, and I've thought about a bunch of them, there is uh, there is a, a flip side to that. I don't care whether you're talking about lights on, lights off, door open this way, that way, go, uh, whatever. So yes, it, it, is, it is possible that, but at least everybody's light up at the same time. The, the shooter's only at, at one place, right? And to think about that, well, we're going to get, we're, we're expecting to get the all clear through that 
medium anyway, but at that time we know it's all clear. Yeah, that's a tough one, but I would say that we would, we would go on the side of getting that message out because if we didn't and we had uh, 78 people in a building that were now evacuating because they thought they should, so yeah, so judgment call, but yeah. Okay. I can tell you, I can tell you with complete honesty, I have no idea. I have no idea. Okay, I think this will be the last question because. Okay. Right. Right. So what my, my, my uh, response to that is, what we want to do in each area is to, because we know what we can't do, is to look for what we can do. I haven't found an area yet that we could not take some steps to mitigate the danger or to make that place more safe. Now, am I saying that we're going to make it impenetrable? It doesn't have to be. All it has to be is tough enough that the person goes to the next door. We just don't, we just don't want them to believe that, that, they, that they're going to get into our door. So then I would say, uh, you know, uh, when I come by or when my guys come by, just point out what you're talking about and we will. We, there's a uh, there's various, uh, like we talked about the uh, extension cords and belts. You can do that on any door that has the two handles or any door that has the closure up top, as long as the closure is on the inside, right? Okay, uh, when, you, when you have the double doors, uh, if, you're, if you're in um, Kobe building and they have the double doors but they don't, have, they, they don't have the room across where you can set a two by four, they've just got that thin uh, thing. Well, I went to Home Depot and I found a, a thin slat of metal, right, that you can slip right in there. I was going around last week, I was, I was looking for various fixes to issues that might come up. So yeah, con contact us and, and show us what you're talking about and we'll try to help you find a fix that you can live with, okay? All right, guys, thanks so much for your time. Be safe.